Hello, welcome back to Walk the Cinema Podcast. Today we're going to be talking about John Ford's Stagecoach. So this was a rewatch for both of us. Yes. Um, we watched it a couple years ago, I guess, at this point, a year oh, yeah, ago. Yeah, I guess so. Where we did kind of a thematic day, or at least a thematic duo, <laughs> where we watched this movie... Stagecoach, and then we watched The Lady Vanishes. Which, which we have an episode out on. You yeah. can go listen to that one. We mentioned Stagecoach in that one, too. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, they're not the same, but they do take place where, you know, strangers meet together to go to- on a journey. Mm. So I guess that's the, th- the theme that we were going with. But this came out in 1939. And it was the first big collaboration between John Ford and John Wayne, which would turn out to be one of the biggest duos in Hollywood history. And this was like the star turning moment for John Wayne, where he'd done like 80 movies before this, but he was not a star. And the biggest movie he had before this kind of flopped. So this one was like D1. That marks the start of uh, John Wayne's big career. And he's not the best actor. In right. comparison to like other people from his era, like Cary Grant. But he has something to him. That he has a look and he's his movies are always fun, even if they're bad. Yeah, he definitely had been typecasted before this. And even this role is still his, technically his typecasted role, you know? Mm-hmm. Where... We'll kind of get into the to the plot line of the movie. So they have this stagecoach, and there's a cast of characters that are all going to go on this journey to try and get to this different town. Mm-hmm. So you have Mrs. Mallory, who's trying to get to her husband, who is a some type of commander. Of, I think more importantly, she's pregnant. Yeah, but about we, to burst. We don't really know that yet. Okay, you know? sure. We just know that she's trying to get to her husband. We have Dallas, who is a prostitute. Um, we also have uh, Doc Boone. Yeah, and both of those characters are kind of expelled from their communities. Yeah, because Doc is uh, he's pretty much drunk all the time. Mm-hmm. And so he's not very helpful to their little community. And then we have a priest who I'm forgetting his name. But he's kind of meek and timid. And then we have a volunteer that goes with Mrs. Mallory to basically protect her because the carriage is basically, they tell their their people that are going on it that they're going through Apache country. Yeah, and there's the, the threat of Geronimo. Mm-hmm. Because I think this is like, during a, an unsettling political period. It's after the Civil War. Yeah. So there's a lot of kind of attacks going on on both sides and a lot of lack of trust. Yeah. And there's also lack of trust between the characters. Yeah. And this manages to have all these characters from different backgrounds, different beliefs. They even have political discussions about the war. And they're all in this carriage together going to the same place trying to avoid the same threat and this movie didn't do that first actually this movie was promoted as grand hotel on wheels so if you know grand hotel from 1932 it's basically you know a bunch of different characters that don't fit together trying to solve issues and there's a lot of drama throughout yeah, so they end up, you know, making it to a certain outpost where they believe Mrs. Mallory's husband is, but turns out he had to go to a different town because he was injured and, you know, she kind of assumes the worst. Um, but that's where we end up finding that she has her baby. And on the on the way there, they meet uh, John Wayne's character. and it's- Which is a great introduction. You kind of just standing there in the middle of nothing and they zoom in on him. And it's like, that's Ringo. <laughs> the kid. But, I mean, he plays pretty much the same thing. If you're, if you're familiar with his... his TV work, yeah, I guess. His, yeah, his TV his movies. serial type you know. 
movie, which weren't really for TV, but they were like double features, very cheap. Yeah. Not very plot heavy or any type of anything heavy. They were just, you know, vastly produced. Mm-hmm. Um, he plays a, a an outlaw that didn't necessarily do anything. It was kind of a a thing of mistaken identity type thing. And He's trying to be... They're blaming him. The plumbers are blaming him for murder of a member of their group that he didn't commit and he got arrested for it he escaped and now he's kind of wanted but they the people in the carriage need him yeah for protection because they're they're still scared that geronimo's group is going to Mm -hmm. to kill them so they know that at least he's a good shot so (laughs) They use him for protection, but under the guise that the sheriff that went with him, I guess, he's a sheriff, right? He's going to arrest him at the end of this journey. Right. That's like, you're going to come with us until we get to the the destination, and then, then when we don't need you anymore. Then we'll arrest you. You will arrest you. Yeah. So it's all throughout, he's kind of like planning an escape. And there's this love interest in, with Dallas. And he tries to involve her in the escape. But she feels... I mean, Dallas is an interesting character because, you know, she she's a prostitute. But I, I, at least on this second watch, I think I picked up more that, that everybody knows except for John Wayne's character mm-hmm. that she's a prostitute. Because yeah. he's not really a part of the community that everybody else is. And Some of them are coming from different towns, but they know. Yeah. Well, at least they saw the spectacle of them being kicked out, you know? Yeah. So. And Claire she... Traver, Dallas, mm-hmm. was the star of the movie at the time. She was the highest paid actor in the whole film. Mm. And she was the most known face. And I think her character is the best one in the movie. Well, she's at least the more dynamic one because she yeah. does feel like... She doesn't deserve happiness, kind of. And, you know, she tries to be kind to others. Like, to for for example, she tries to, to get Mrs. Mallory to lean on her mm-hmm. while they're riding in the carriage. And Mallory is kind of like, mm-mm, yeah, and, and, I'm good. And when they offer them water, mm-hmm. Mallory drinks out of a silver cup. And then Ringo's like, you're not going to offer Dallas any. And then when they give Dallas water she has to drink it out of the canteen because she's inferior in a way at least to them and it's like the little nods that like they don't even see her as everyone looks at her like a prostitute including mallory Mm -hmm. and ringo is the only one that likes her and believes her to be the same as others yeah and i don't think there's super superiority when it comes to this type of thing we're all in the same Stagecoach, we're all going to the same place. Yeah. Why is everyone acting like she's worse than us? Yeah. And she, you know, as the movie goes on, she does help Mrs. Mallory when she gives birth and she takes care of the baby while she sleeps and, you know, all this other stuff. She proves that she is a good person, you know? And so, like, the opinions of her, at least in the group, become different, you know? Mm -hmm. And at some point, Ringo proposes, and she doesn't accept or, you know, reject, because she gets interrupted, but she asks the doctor if she's even worthy of having the proposal, of being happy, you know? Mm. And it's it's a, uh, it's definitely a, a touching moment i guess all the characters change though yeah the doctor stops drinking Mm -hmm. ringo is proven to be the hero and not the villain of of the story like people believe that he didn't do it yeah and he saves the day this is a very traditional film in that sense in every sense this is a very traditional film and i think that's why it's so great like it's such a good example of filmmaking because it's so traditional and by the book not everything is necessarily by the book. There's a lot of scenes where you can see the roof or the the ceiling of houses while they're inside of the house, mm-hmm. and that's not a that's not a traditional way of shooting 
inside of the house unless you're trying to portray like claustrophobia or something like that like tension mm-hmm. so not everything is traditional but this is such a good example of filmmaking if you're gonna make a movie like you're planning on being a director that makes movies i think this is a movie you gotta watch and analyze for the just the traditional feeling of it of course it's a classic and it's like a good example of why a lot of westerns are good and they're not just this cheap genre like they were believed to be at some point this is also an early sound western because westerns fell out of favor with sound movies like they're still being made but not regarded highly and this was i think part of that is because you had so many Western movies being yeah. made for, like, we say they're TV, but, you know, uh, before that, you know, you had to go to the theater to watch it, mm-hmm. and it was like, you paid whatever the price of a ticket was, and you got to see, like, two or three of these John yeah. Wayne movies. But that's, that's what you had in, like, 80s, 90s with horror, where everyone could make one and everyone was making one, so, like, it was regarded as this genre that doesn't matter. And yeah. even to this day... When you look at the big awards and the big people, like, at the Oscars, they kind of disregard horror movies. Westerns aren't disregarded as much because there's very few being made, and they're mostly by legends. Yeah, nowadays. Yeah, so they, they, like, Powered the Dog is a recent one that almost won Best Picture. was very close to it. But if there was the amount of Westerns coming out as horror movies, I don't think the notion would have changed. Right. I I agree to you with you to some degree. I think this movie for me overall is aged. Mm. You know, where I don't feel like the story is necessarily timeless. I think it is. I don't I I disagree wholeheartedly because I mean we talked about how we watched um this Lady movie Vanish. and Lady Vanishes on the same day and I think that that kind of put it more into perspective for me because Lady Vanishes is older by a year or two, I think. Um, And that one feels so much fresher and like a lot of people can relate to it. And it it just feels more timeless even, you know, than than, than this movie does. I think there's multiple reasons for that. I think that one is less grounded. You know, it's about an international spy Mm. at the end of the day. So it's less grounded in what would have happened. And the other factor is that this one is set in the 1800s. So automatically it's going to feel older. And this was also lost at at points. So the print we have today isn't the original negative. So it's not the quality that we had, that we have with Lady Vanishes, where everything was preserved. So I think there's a lot of factors that could age it. I, I, just, don't, I, I don't necessarily disagree with you that it feels older. But I think there's a reason that it feels older. But this feels just... It's so good. It's so well done and so well put together. And the characters are interesting. The tension is there. I think everything is just done well. I understand that some people might not think anything is done like great. But it's at least done well. Yeah, I would say it's still done well. I just feel like I don't connect to the movie as much. And I feel like, you know, it. it I'm pretty sure it did do fairly well when it came out. Mm-hmm. Like this movie wasn't, it's not like one of those movies where it did awful. And now no. that we've rediscovered it, we have an appreciation for it. It did well. It did well from the beginning. It was, I think the concept at the time was very popular. That's why, again, they marketed it as Grand Hotel on Wheels because there's that's already a movie that did well and people like. And it did so well at the time that even, like, Orson Welles was inspired by it to make Citizen Kane a couple years later. So it's, yeah, it was an unknown and it it didn't flop or anything like that. It did very well. Yeah, but my point with that was that, like, it's it doesn't resonate with audiences today as, as much as I think it would, it did back I then. I disagree. 
I just well, I may be biased because I don't necessarily like like westerns all that much because I, it's just not a genre that speaks to me in any way. I think that a lot of the things that made westerns um, popular back in the day and even today to some degree is the romantic romanticization of uh, America mm-hmm. when we were still building it, sure. and there was like you know basically a world of unknown that like man could conquer and he was his own rule maker because mm. even when you had even when you had outlaws right it's not like they could catch you easily you right. know or they didn't have gps's or uh... so yeah you either were the outlaw and you you know you, you had the outlaw centric where they were smarter than everybody else and you know they were either doing good but they were being blamed mm-hmm. for something or, you know, they were, like, basically like a Robin Hood type right. situation. Or you had the opposite where, like, the main character, the John Wayne character, was, like, the sheriff of the town. And he was so smart that he kept everyone safe from right. the bandits or the 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 Native American group that the particular movie right. wanted to target type this thing. This is very much, like, do-gooder, red-blooded American movie yeah but it doesn't bash you over the head with it which i appreciate i think it would be a lot worse if it was like so much about john wayne Mm. rather than the the group of characters because it's about the group it's it's about the people in the carriage it's not about one of them even though he saves he saves them right and they need him they kind of need all of them they need dallas to protect the baby they need the doctor to to be a doctor, right? Yeah. They need Buck to drive the carriage. They need the sheriff. They they need everyone, to some extent. More yeah. than just, like, they're all hiding behind John Wayne as he shoots his gun. Yeah. No, I get that. I'm just, I'm just trying to explain why maybe westerns aren't my favorite thing. It's just because it's... But besides being a western, you know. and besides being John Wayne or John Ford, this is just... So well done. Like, I, I can't <laughs> express that enough. I'll just... It's all the techniques done by someone that knows them well. Yeah, and I will say that this is one of the earlier movies that I've at least experienced where you have, like, these really wide shot moving images mm-hmm. where they basically have a high speed chase Mm -hmm. being shown where you have the carriage being pulled and then you have all of the geronimo's men trying to go after them yeah those are the part that were done in arizona in the valley that john ford grew to love and he did a lot of movies there everything else was done in studio yeah the inside of the carriage and all the indoor sets yeah but you have this really i think it would i would assume it's intricate uh setup oh they're they're, extremely difficult and you can't mess them up too many times because you don't have the horse, the horses. Yeah, <laughs> you don't you're gonna the, the you're film. gonna legitimately end up like killing the horses and getting a lot of men injured, which is an unfortunate part of like filmmaking history. It's I an would unfortunate say. part of especially westerns. There's a lot of horses that unfortunately got hurt. Uh, and you know, as we all know, if horses break their legs, they, there's no putting them in casts and nursing yeah. them back to health. So. That that's like another part of of just a, these old movies in general that sometimes takes me out of it. Not mm. that it's the fault of the movie necessarily, and obviously there's times where you can like separate the the art from you know the maybe unsavory parts that went into making it. But it's always something that like kind of pops into my head when I see an animal in these kinds of. Um, movies like especially back in the day where it's like did that animal survive that shot well we Maybe. all know no, none of them are alive now so yeah i guess in the end it's a <laughs> it's a net zero but it's definitely something that I, I think about sometimes and i don't i don't necessarily think that it makes me dislike the movie mm. more or less you know right it's just an observation but my biggest criticism which is something you don't seem to care about and I like the movie more, and I criticize it is the cartoonishness of a lot of the characters. Yeah, Buck talks in a goofy voice the whole time. Doctor Boone gets a little annoying because he does the same thing over and over again with the alcohol. 
Like, we get it. That's what he does. But it repeats it too many times with him just seeking it. Mm. Which I get plays into the ending, but it's a little too cartoonish. And then you have the Mexican guy that's married to an Apache that says, I think. Mm -hmm. And he keeps saying, I think. And it's kind of funny. But it's also like, do we need it to be funny? Yeah, I, I mean, I get what you're saying. But I feel like with Buck, that might just be his voice, because I, I know that he he's in a, he plays a, a Robin Hood character. It might be his voice, but he was definitely casted for it, I feel. Yeah, probably. I feel like he was casted because that voice would fit what they wanted out of that character, which is not a serious character and all that, but his voice is a little annoying. Hmm. It can't change it. It's not the man's fault. No. I mean, I, I get the criticism. It's just not something that I necessarily, like, paid it that much attention to because it wasn't, like, I don't know. I, I feel like I just dislike the movie for, I and it, it's not that I dislike it. I enjoy watching it. It's a fine film, I think, and especially, <laughs> you know, culturally, historically, it's relevant mm -hmm. and important. But I just, from a story-making perspective, a storytelling position and a genre position. It's just not my favorite and not something right. that I would like hold dear. So know? what's your rating? Um, I give it a seven out of 10, which I know you think is low, but I feel like that's as fair of a rating for me as I can possibly give it. Cause it, again, like I said, it, this isn't a movie that I particularly enjoy on a great extent, you know, like, mm. the story's good. I just feel like all of the little things that, like, since I'm not a fan of Westerns, the fact that there isn't, like, a great print of this out there kind of takes it takes away from it. The fact that, you know, that it's a, it's a John Wayne movie. I feel like I've been so saturated with John <laughs> Wayne movies because, I mean, there's literally hundreds of them. Yeah. Um, it, and I don't I don't know, but it is still good. And I see the different aspects of filmmaking that really went into this. And, and John Ford, I think, did care about making this movie. And mm -hmm. I think he made it well. So I feel like seven out of ten is fair for me. Yeah, I give it a nine when I, I earlier gave it a ten the first time we watched it. And now I dropped it again. There was smaller things that upset me a little bit. The cartoonishness of a lot of the comedy relief type characters. But just as someone that loves movies, I think this is such a good example of one. It's such a movie type movie. That doesn't make any sense. But uh, it's it's so well done. And I think, again, if you're going to make movies, watch this multiple times. It's a good example. And if you if it's only as good as Stagecoach, it's pretty damn good. And you gotta be someone that knows what they're doing to make something that comes out this good. Yeah. And that's more than the screenplay, which John Ford didn't write. Mm. And it's more than the actors, which Claire Trevor was the biggest one back then. Now she's like the fourth, fifth yeah, biggest one. Potentially, I think. So yeah. it's not the power of the actors or the script. It, it, it really is, I think, it really is, I think, the power of the director and, and the filmmaking in general that makes this stand the test of time. And you said there's no good print and there's really not. If you have HBO Max or Criterion, watch those. Those are the better prints. Yeah. Prime Video and Tubi and like the free services have like the crappy print. But even the HBO Max and Criterion, they're not that good. <laughs> I don't think the movie looks that good. Which, yeah, Period, it's not necessarily the, the movie's fault, No, right? the, the just... original negatives weren't there. I think this was, like, rebuilt negatives from, like, something that John Wayne had that played in theaters and then he kept. Oh, that's pretty cool. That's a cool story, though. John Wayne helping preserve his his legacy. <laughs> the movie that made him a star. Yeah. But and this really did make him a star because after this, you know, he became a, a household name. He's, yeah, John Ford. He's really, the Duke, you know? John Ford really built him, too. Like, he would cast him. They were friends. Even before this, they were friends. But he yeah. really just kept casting him as the lead. Yeah, until and it, it, people it made, were just yeah. like, okay, okay, we get it. He's a star. <laughs> <laughs> so, anywho's, if you like this episode, uh... 
Give us a five-star rating or a thumbs up on YouTube. Follow us. You can write a review in podcast services. And yeah, we'll see you next week.